BCFM is the community radio station for Bristol and is here to give everybody in Bristol a voice. Welcome back to Friday Drive Time with Oxford economist Martin Summers and me, Tony Gosling. Almost five years ago, on the 7th of July 2005, three explosions on the London Underground and one on a bus claimed 56 lives. The attacks shocked the nation in the middle of the G8 summit at Glen Eagles and all talk of dealing with the problems of mounting debt made way with an attack that swept away all doubts about the terror threat to Britain. The terror threat was now real. But this is unfinished business. Many unanswered questions remain, and as time has passed, evidence has trickled out that entirely contradicts some of the Home Office and Police version of events that day. In the absence of a public inquiry, which has been blocked by successive Attorney Generals and Prime Ministers, in the next hour we'll do our own inquiry into the 7-7 London bombings. One young man living here in Bristol who just missed out on a job offer for the government's surveillance service, GCHQ, in Cheltenham, because he was away from home, was immediately suspicious about the attacks. Adrian Connock immediately set about compiling what is arguably the most comprehensive website documenting all the news articles and interviews circulating in the aftermath of the attacks. And he joins me now. Hello, Adrian, and welcome to Drive Time. Hi, Tony. Glad to be here. Now, first of all, can you remind us, where did the three attacks take place? Uh, that would be Aldgate, Edgware Road, and um, the number 30 bus going to Houston. Who were the actual, what are the names of the alleged bombers? Shezad Tanweer, uh, Mohammed Siddiqui Khan, Hasib Hussein, and Jermaine Lindsay. Um, um, and what about your film, Mind the Gap? Because you made this uh, h- roughly how long after the attacks? Uh, it was almost a year afterwards. And why did it, why, what, what really prompted you to do it? Well, no one else was really doing it, so I took it upon myself to make the film. I'd never made a film before, but I turned out a script and got David Shaler involved and um, produced it quite easily, really. A lot of people wanted to help me. Um, They saw it as an opportunity to put out views that hadn't been um, put out on the mainstream. Well, thanks, Adrian. We'll be talking to you throughout the next hour. Now, Robert Webb lives just over the border from here in Wales. He lost his sister Laura that day and I spoke to him in an exclusive interview which I recorded lo- uh, earlier this year about how the experience affected him and his family. My name is uh, Robert Webb. Um, what can I say about my sister? How do you encompass a life lived very well for 29 years and which was ended so suddenly? Um, she she was probably one of the most interesting and remarkable people I think I'll ever know. Um, and I guess that's a strange thing to say, you know, when, you, when you're only middle-aged and you, you expect to have a long and happy life ahead of you. But she really was very exceptional. She was a um, very happy, vibrant, bright person. Uh, she travelled around the world twice. Um, she had more friends than I could ever ever keep up with but what's more she never forgot birthdays or anniversaries or anything like that so she was always around for people she's very very good aunt to my two nephews um very good daughter obviously for my parents um and just an all-round generally very very nice person to have around i was very proud to have her as a sister um you know we speak very often um always made a point of you know whenever i was in london on business catching up and of course whenever i was uh, you know going to the family you know to stay with my parents she'd always come along my brother and his family and fantastic you know we're a good nice family um laura was a fantastic sister fantastic daughter what, what, what did she do did she have a profession was she married she um lived with her boyfriend and she was a PA in an advertising agency. She'd always, you know, been interested in that area. And, um, you know, that was that was a job she had. And she enjoyed it very much. And she's very well regarded by her employers. Now, uh, how did she get caught up in the bombing? I could use the term wrong time, a wrong time, a wrong place. But, of course, she wasn't in the wrong time in the wrong place. She was where exactly where she had every right to be. She was on the way to work. Like so many people caught up in it she was going about her normal legitimate business without doing any harm to anybody she was on the way to work she was running slightly late um and she caught the train at king's cross and of course you know never reached her destination which was paddington she was aiming to get to so which of the bombs was she actually involved in it was the edgeware road uh, bombing um perpetrated by Mohammed Siddiqui khan now how did you first hear that she may be may have been caught up? Hmm. 
that's a really difficult question to answer um it's a kind of you don't get a victim list or anything like that it's a kind of gradual realization that something's wrong um i've been at work and um obviously working in pr you want to be checking what's going on in the world and um just caught um something on the web um i think it was on the bbc uh, about some power surges in london they didn't seem quite right you know because i i lived and worked in london for a long time and i don't remember power surges uh so anyway i went off to a meeting and did a few other things and went back on and then there was news it looked like bombings uh or some kind of incident like that um and so i just rang her um which is as much an excuse just to have a chat as anything else i hadn't seen her for a week or spoken to her for a week so um you know it was oh you're all right yeah fine right what you been up to you know that that kind of thing really so um i i just got a voicemail and um then i kept trying on and off i was doing other stuff as well but going back to what i was saying about her being very thoughtful and person kept up she would always respond and she didn't and so i began to think well okay there's a bit of a problem here also some of the other people i'd contacted to see they're okay um had come back um my my then boss his um daughter uh was in london that day she'd rung back saying it was all right she was all right and so i, I think by early afternoon I was beginning to get quite worried because it wasn't like her at all. A partner was beginning to get quite worried. My mum was beginning to get quite worried. So by the end of the day, um, it was obvious that something was wrong. But of course, everything was really confused then. There were people in hospital, you know, their clothes had been blown off them, their identity, you know, so we, nobody knew who, the, who on earth they were. There were conflicting reports over casualties. Um, people were in all kinds of different hospitals as well. There was no central coordination um, of names of people. And I really think that for the first two, three th days, things were very, very confused. Um, I travelled to London the next day, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't for a week that she was formally um, identified as being uh, one of the dead. So that must have been very difficult uh, that week. Uh, yeah, that's something of an understatement. <laughs> um, sorry, I, I, it's, yeah, it, it, it was, it was horrible. Um, but I guess you've got two choices. Um, you can either sit back and wait for somebody to come and tell you, oh, well, we found them, um, you know, they're in hospital. And, um, or, um, I'm sorry, we've identified, identified them as one of the dead. So you can either sit back and wait for wait for that message, or you can go out and actively look for them and you know our family being our family we went out to actively look for her um my brother uh and i my and my um my then girlfriend now wife um went into london um several days on the trot um following up you know my brother had gone around the hospitals you know the night of the bombings um so we visited some of the hospitals we had meetings with the police um in the line of work i i mean i found it very easy to you know contact the media and to deal with the media and that was a very key thing for us i mean from from their point of view um they had they had already access to the story um and from my point of view you know we could get a description out there um but obviously they wanted to help you know i mean journalists are human beings the same as anyone else they desperately wanted to help us find her as well um i suppose as time went on it was looking less and less likely that she was alive and well but Again, there's that choice. Do you write somebody off, a loved one off as being dead without having any evidence that they're dead? Or do you work on the basis that they may still be alive, however remote that possibility? And again, we worked on the basis she was still alive. We didn't give up on her right until the end when her body, you know, it was confirmed that her body had been found. I know some of the fam families were, were really angry and some even went to the extent of... Uh, going around London on lampposts putting up photographs of their loved ones I mean do, do you did you have any sympathy with their anger it depends where you direct your anger doesn't it um I guess at the time I was frustrated I felt that I felt that the authorities should be able to um you know wave a magic wand and they would know but you know you look back on it in hindsight and you look at the enormity four major bombing incidents in a major capital city um huge amount of confusion the three 
on the underground survivors had come out from different stations so there was a confusion over you know where the bombings had taken place then you know without wanting to go into too much detail for you know kind of like a pre-watershed audience there's an awful lot of forensic work and picking around to do these were bombs these bomb the, there was shrapnel from the bombs there was shrapnel in the train frankly it was you know like I, I think maybe leave it to people's imaginations how difficult it's going to be to um, to investigate a bombing like that. Also, they needed to understand who the perpetrators were, and you know when when you know it became apparent to the authorities that it was suicide bombings, they needed to identify the people quickly and you know do the necessary investigation work. You know, was there anyone else involved? Um, so that work had to be done. So yes, it was frustrating. Um, there's a lot of anger, I think, I have towards the bombers, but none, none towards the authorities in the way that they responded. I think, I think, I hope, I think, I know, well, I know that lessons have been learned. I think things could probably have been done better, but can we really blame or condemn anybody for the way in which they handled an incident like that? I, I wouldn't, no. Uh, are you satisfied then with the subsequent judicial process of finding responsibility? I think we've got to be clear about separate responsibility from the judicial process. As far as I'm concerned, the responsibility rests with four named people, and those were the four bombers, um, and anybody unnamed, unidentified, who may have assisted them in that, or inspired them, or encouraged them, or anything like that. That's it. As the humans, we have a choice. They made a conscious decision to go out and kill and maim innocent people. They're the ones who are responsible for this. In terms of a wider investigation as to what things that we as a society can learn, could the bombings have been prevented through better intelligence and security work? Um, could we learn lessons in terms of, you know, the way in which, you know, people can get bombs onto trains and buses um, and the communication between the security, you know, the um, um, emergency response services after, after the incidents? Yes, I think there's a lot of work that could be done. I think there have been a number of investigations and reports so far. I think the Greater London Assembly have done a good job. I feel that the um, the government's ones are skirting around the real issue, and the real issue is that we do need an independent inquiry um, to see just what was known prior to the bombings. Because if you look at the, intelligence, the initial Intelligence and Security Committee report, that didn't reflect the revelations from the so-called crevice trial, which came later, that far from being clean skins, as the government had um, described the bombers early on, um, they were, you know, a number of them were known um, to the authorities. And in fact, Khan, Siddiqui Khan, the man who killed my sister, had been followed home um, by security officers, had been photographed as well. Um, I obviously have concerns about that, not only, you know, from a strictly you know from a personal quite selfish point of view that you know i would like you know i would have wanted the death of my sister but to be prevented but there are 51 other people who died as well and we should never forget that nearly 800 people were injured by the bombs um and also of course this kind of thing could happen in the future and i would want to be satisfied that we can learn the lessons and if these things can be prevented in the future so you know that'd be great and i have to say i mean you know sort of touch wood and every prayer that I, I can you know it's been nearly five years now and it hasn't been a successful attack you know and I think I think that does reflect well. Yeah, you say an independent inquiry um, do you think uh, that sorry, uh, when you say independent um, how can you guarantee that an inquiry is going to be actually independent? Well it's got to be independent the government um, I mean, we, we can mess around with semantics about how, you know, how you define independent. Um, independent of government would suit me um, along the lines of many, of you know, inquiries, inquiries in the past, um, whether that's headed by, you know, a judge or something like that, or whether a you know, Home Affairs Select Committee are looking at it now, and that's, that's independent of government, as we've seen from their conclusions. There's been, they've been distinctly as conclusion be distinctly uncomfortable for governments in the past and so i'm happy that they're looking into it and i'll be interested to see what they conclude so five years on how has this left you feeling the experience i think anyone who loses a loved one is 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 scarred you know um 
even if we lose a loved one, you know, at the kind of like the right age, and they've lo- had a long, happy and fruitful life, it's still sad. My father died before my daughter was born. And, you know, I'm still sad that although my father, you know, died naturally, at, you know, in his 80s, um, I'm still sorry that he never made his granddaughter. I'm still sorry that he's not around to speak to now. And that's a natural grief that we all have. When somebody, when you lose somebody long, long before their time, um, you know, say a road accident or something else, you know, I mean, that that would make you feel very, very raw. Um, It's very, very upsetting. But when you lose somebody as a result of murder, a premeditated attack um, on innocent people, then I don't... I don't think you ever really get over a death or a recover. You're not quite the same person afterwards. You kind of learn from it. But this, this is something, um, five years on, I'm not able to forgive the people behind it. Um, and, you know, I am angry that my, my sister didn't have the long, happy, and enjoyable life um, that she deserved and that she should have had. Have you seen enough evidence... For, to satisfy you that the police have done their job correctly in identifying these four bombers? Um, there's some things, you know, there's some conversations we've had, you know, you can't really, you know, sort of discuss. Um, but I'm happy that they've identified the people concerned. There's been a lot of good uh, work done by journalists uh, following up some of the stories behind, um, behind the bombers. Um, you have, of course, the, the two suicide videos, um, including the one, from, one, one of the ones from Khan. Um, so I'm satisfied they've identified the right people. I know, I know there hasn't been a, a judicial process which has, you know, actually said X was responsible and stuff like that. But um, I've got no reason to believe that they've got it wrong and I've got no reason to believe that, you know there's any particular conspiracy or anything behind that as far as i'm concerned it's open and shut um the country was on a state of alert for um you know a terrorist attack from islamic extremists suicide bombings regretfully are a way that some have decided to pervert islam by saying that uh, suicide bombings um are a good thing to do and would lead to a, a reward so suicide bo- bombings are entirely consistent with with the way that this, um, some of the some of these people operate, and um, as I say, um, the the four people concerned have been ident- you know have been identified to my satisfaction certainly. Because one of the things that many people have pointed out is that there really aren't any CCTV pictures actually putting these four guys on those trains, and even with the bus bomb, we were told that unfortunately the CCTV cameras on the bus weren't working so we haven't seen any pictures of the bus bomber alleged bus bomber on the bus uh, does that bother you i think what you've got to realize is that due legal process is not complete yet i mean i think we've got kind of appetite in this country where we we expect to have everything now and that, that doesn't always happen and um when When you've got ongoing criminal investigation, which, of course, was only actually concluded last year, there were, you know, another three people put on trial um, for allegedly assisting with the bombings, and there was a lot more information came out as a result of that. Okay, they were found not guilty, but there was a lot more information came out as a result, and that had to be held back because it could prejudice the trial. We haven't had the inquests yet. And again, you can't prejudice the inquests. There is going to be more information, I'm sure, um, will come out, you know, in due course. I'm sure further CCTV footage beyond what we've already seen, which, of course, is quite substantial, will come out. Um, But I understand fully that some things have got to be kept back pending any future inquiries. That was Robert Webb there speaking to me earlier this year, and he lost his daughter Laura in the Edgware... Sorry, his his sister Laura in the Edgware Road blast. Now, many survivors and families are not satisfied by Sir Ian Blair's press conference a a few days after the attacks announcing who did it, nor the so-called Home Office narrative, which was published ten months after the attacks. Last month, this year... When it was announced that inquests without juries would take place into the deaths, the solicitor for the survivors, some who felt sidelined by the process, organised a press conference. We hope now that the Home Secretary will withdraw her opposition to a judicial investigation and that at last the survivors, all of those affected by the London bombings, uh, will be able to have the answers they want. 
There is um, relief, relief that she has uh, adjourned the inquests or the decision into whether to resume the inquests of the bombers so that these 52 inquests will now take place without uh, the inquests of the other four being joined to them. And it's right to say, finally, that there is a degree of disappointment. Uh, that disappointment comes from the uh, survivors. The survivors were forced into a campaign for an inquiry simply because successive Home Secretaries refused it. An awful lot of pain and grief could have been avoided if three years ago, when we first asked for it, the government had decided to hold a public inquiry. But there is now a relief that the inquest will be held. They wanted to play a more active part in it, um, but uh, they have been told that they cannot do so. Uh, and you may remember at the uh, conclusion of the uh, preliminary hearings, uh, Rachel North, who had been one of the many campaigners for an inquiry, um, asked for a statement to be read out, and I will read to you, if I may, one paragraph from it, because this sums up, I think, the views of each and every one of the survivors. Uh, she said this, It appears to me that if you are a member of the public who is unfortunate enough to survive a terrorist atrocity, then no matter how much your pain, your physical and or mental injuries cause you, no matter how much your life is blighted, no matter how much your health, career, personal life, relationships, family, sense of self is affected, no matter whether you become suicidal, no matter how much your life is changed, reduced and damaged, you will have no right to ask questions about what happened to you and to expect answers to be given to you. You may be called as a witness for the benefit of others, but that is all. You may not see documents or ask questions. You may not expect a public inquiry. You should just be quiet and be grateful that you are alive. Gentlemen, ladies, that's all I want to say. Um, I will take questions. More importantly, it's the views of those sitting alongside me that you want to hear, and they have agreed to take questions from you. Alison Funk of Sky News, perhaps we can pick up on the final point you made there, and I address this question to uh, the survivors. Uh, you're not going to be able to have legal representation at the inquest. What do you feel that you would have brought to the inquest had that decision been your way? We have questions that need answering. We were allowed to submit some questions to the Intelligence and Security Committee, but those questions were not answered. We want assurances about recommendations that will be made. We have... Um, our role now will be one of um, answering questions only, we, which we will do willingly, but... Um, our questions are not going to be answered unless they're asked by someone else who's uh, one of the bereaved. We are, again, we've been shunted aside by um, officialdom and uh, those questions may or may not be answered. And those questions need to be answered because um, it does involve the safety of um, everyone, everyone who travels on public transport or goes to any public place. So do you feel the inquest would be less effective as a result? I hope it won't be. I really hope it won't be. And um, it, it's very important that we all remember that the inquests are for the families and the loved ones um, of those who died. But this is our only voice. There's, we've been um, led to believe that this would be an opportunity for us to have a voice. And no, we don't. That was a, a press conference organised by the Solicitor for Survivors of the 7-7 London bombings uh, just about a month ago. Uh, now, Adrian Connock is joining me, a filmmaker. Uh, we have questions, she says. The questions have not been answered, and she's actually saying there the survivors have been shunted aside. Well, that's right. Lady Justice Hallett, of the um, member of the Honourable Society of the Inner Temple, who's in charge of the coroner's inquest, has... Uh, not granted any of the survivors interested person status which would give them the right to question witnesses and to access the evidence so that is why they're, they're quite upset about that 
Um, she has also refused to call an independent jury into the inquest, and this is due to the apparent sensitivity of the intelligence material. So it seems the survivors are not getting access that they want, and the security services are being protected. Now, Martin, um, there is a possibility here that this is a false flag attack. Would you like to just uh, explain what a false flag is and what the origin of the uh, expression is? Uh, the term false flag comes from 18th century naval warfare, um, because this is in the days before telecommunications or whatever, so a ship would sail towards the enemy but flying their flag so that they think it's their, one of their friends and then when they get, very, they get up close they suddenly run up their own flag and open fire. So a false flag terrorist attack is a terrorist attack that's ostensibly carried out by one group but is in fact being used to uh, frame another group and the classic example might be the burning of the Reichstag in the 1930s which was blamed on the communists and then uh, Hitler was able to round up all of the communists because the Reichstag was burned down although subsequent historical uh, uh, investigation has suggested it wasn't actually the communists who burned down the Reichstag it was probably somebody associated with Hitler himself so you can see how these kind of things can work and of course the the uh, all around the world large numbers of people are convinced that the September the 11th attacks in 2001 in the United States were potentially a false flag attack. But what and might that includes members of the Russian general staff, for example. But what might be a potential motive for a false flag attack in the London bombings case? Uh, well, the, as, 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 as the uh, contributors have pointed out, uh, this is the only major terrorist attack that's taken place. And if no terrorist attacks take place, people might start to question whether there is a terrorist threat or there isn't a terrorist threat. Uh, I think we need to look back to the 1980s when a lot of these jihadist groups were, were founded uh, with the help of the Western Security Services. There's no doubt about that. That's a matter of historical record. MI6, the CIA, in collaboration with Mossad in the background, set up an awful lot of jihadi terrorist groups to fight in Afghanistan. Now, you could see this as potentially blowback. We said we've created a Frankenstein's monster and it's now out of our control. But of course, many people around the world outside of middle class England they think, hmm, actually, you may still be in control of these terrorist groups and that you're actually creating these kind of events. So, for example, we saw the bombing of Bologna Railway Station in 1980. Italian parliamentary inquiry has definitely shown that that was carried out by their own security forces in order to create a, a strategia di tensione, a, cre a creation of tension, uh, a creation of fear, so that certain political goals can be fulfilled. Now, I'm not saying that that's what did happen on 7-7, but it's a perfectly logical thing to ask is this what's going on? And that's what an inquiry might help to uncover, well, one, one of the way thing, or another. One of the things that uh, definitely mitigates against that is the suicide videos, Adrian. Um, what about those? Well, the one of Khan, the lip sync, is, is out. Um, and, of course, these videos just come from unknown providence. We don't really know the source. They're released on Al Jazeera. They haven't been scrutinised in any kind of court. Um, none of the evidence, in fact, uh, against the men has actually been scrutinised in a court. And so it, it is possible these videos were made under some other pretense. And, and people should remember that the, the actual bombings in London are not mentioned in either video by Khan or Tam Weir. So for me, I don't think they would be admissible in a court of law as conclusive ed evidence. Can I just make the further point that nobody's suggesting here that these chaps might not have been genuine jihadi terrorists. And they may or may not have been. But the way false flag terrorism works is that you have patsies who are put in the frame to look as if they did it, but in actual fact the actual bombing is done by somebody else. So we had uh, the 19 terrorists who supposedly hijacked planes on September the 11th and they crashed the planes into the buildings. But the suggestion is because nanothermite has been found in the rubble by investigators from Copenhagen University that, that the, f the, the, uh, the, so the so-called 19 hijackers and the planes are a diversion from the actual bombing of the three buildings that went down on September the 11th, including the Building 7. Now, because we're living in a universe where false flag terrorism is, is going on. In Turkey, the police have arrested a lot of their top generals for false flag terrorist offences. It's legitimate, and it's certainly within the Muslim community, as you well know, Tony, questions are being asked about whether this is a false flag terrorist event of a kind which is very common in Pakistan, where many Muslims come from. Middle England very rarely gets bombed. So they always take the straightforward explanation of what uh, which they're presented with. Other parts of the world get bombed all the time, and they get a much more sophisticated analysis of what might be happening. 
Right, let's go back to 2005 and to the day itself. The Guardian's Mark Honningsbaum rushed straight down to the scene of the Edgware Road underground blast and filed this audio report for the Guardian website where he talks about the bomb being under the train and the floor tiles having been lifted up. This is Mark Honningsbaum reporting from the London, uh, the London Hilton Hotel opposite Edgware Road Station where we believe there was an explosion this morning under the carriage of a train. I've been speaking to survivors all morning. Uh, people were evacuated, first of all, to Marks and Spencers beside the underground and then uh, across the road to the London Hilton where there are some people in very, very bad injuries. There was a woman who got cuts and burns to her face and is being wrapped uh, from head uh, to neck in, in bandages as, as people with blood cuts. But, I mean, the main thing... Is, main thing is people are extremely shook up still. Um, what seems to have happened is that sometime around 9.30 this morning, passengers uh, in a train from Edgware Road travelling to Paddington, they just left Edgware Road station when suddenly they felt they had a massive explosion. Uh, and some passengers described how the tiles, the covers uh, on the floor of the train suddenly flew up raised up and the next thing they know there was another almighty crash which they now believe was a train travelling in the opposite direction hitting their train which had been derailed by this explosion That was Guardian's Mark Heinsbaum reporting on the 7th of July 2005 itself from the site of the attack at the Edgware Road tube bomb. Now uh, he actually does say there that the bomb was underneath the train and yet in the the article which actually appeared in the next day's Guardian uh, he was saying that the bomb was inside the train and I actually phoned up Mark Honingsbaum about two three weeks after the attacks um, and asked him why there was a discrepancy and he said to me well Tony all I can say is not everything I submit in copy ends up in the next day's newspaper. So that's a, certainly an, a sort of unexplained thing. But, but, but what does it really tell us, do you think, uh, if the floor tiles are lifted up? Surely, uh, you know, if it was a suicide bomber in there, Adrian, that might happen too. Well, absolutely, that might be the case. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, we should point out there is, it's, that's not the only source. Um, other witnesses, for example, Bruce Late, is quoted as saying, the policeman said, mine that hole, that's where the bomb was. The metal was pushed upwards as if the bomb was underneath the train. So, of course, you know, I'm not an expert on what happens when bombs go off, but coupled with the police saying that the bombs were definitely placed on the ground and the la all, most of the injuries are lower body injuries, um, people saying, another quote here from Angelo Power, people were physically ejected from their seats, so that would certainly implicate some kind of force from underneath. Um, at the tiles on the floor of my carriage suddenly shot up, Anita Kingsley, and, and it goes on and on. So, coupled together with these bits of evidence, it, it is possible, I think feasible, to speculate that the bombs may have been underneath the train. And we should remember that back in the Intelligence Security Report of 06, they actually state that they are not certain that the men actually detonated the bombs. And I should also point you to the coroner's inquest of 2010, where they are talking about assessing the likely development of assembly of the explosive devices in regard to the four men. So in other words, they're not actually sure that they actually developed the explosive devices, and they're not certain they actually detonated them. So I think it is, uh, it's um, free to speculate, really. The names of the four alleged bombers were announced by the Chief Constable of the Metropolitan Police, Sir Ian Blair, on Tuesday, July the 12th, and almost a year later, the Home Office issued a narrative of what happened. But almost immediately, people began to pick it apart and found some fundamental errors. Uh, now, Adrian, this whole business of the train times, can you just explain that? Because uh, apparently the, uh, the train time given in the government official account turned out to be nonsense. Well, that's right. Um, for over a year, the press and the police were reporting that they caught the 740 train from Luton to Thameslink, Kings Cross. Um, that actually turned out that the train didn't actually run that day. And it was John Reid that actually amended this in July of 2006, uh, saying that the police had actually got that wrong, and it was apparently actually the 725 that they caught. Um, this puts um, a few problems in the official timeline because to get to the first explosion, um, some researchers have been down there and actually 
suggests that the men could not have had time to have made it if they'd caught this earlier train. Now, well, one of the things I'm really surprised about, though, is that there still is no conclusive evidence as to whether the explosives used were uh, a military type of explosive or a homemade explosive. Well, that's right. I mean, the only thing we've had is the Intelligence Security Committee report of 06 saying that they were peroxide-based devices. Um, but there's been, I mean, if you go into my website, officialconfusion.com, and click on the explosives link on the left... You can read uh, a collage of, of media reports that all contradict each other um, about the, the type of detonation, about the type of explosives. And certainly the witness reports and the damage and the injuries seem to be um, synonymous with C4 explosives rather than some kind of peroxide-based device. Um, and the inquest of 2010, the coroner's inquest, there is a report now being prepared... Um, at the moment about the explosive devices, so perhaps we will learn more over the coming months. Now, we, we heard from Robert Webb earlier that he was rather annoyed that uh, MI5 admitted afterwards that uh, they had been putting um, Mohammed Siddiqui Khan under surveillance. He had been for some time, and uh, it is, is possible um, that he was even an, uh, an MI5 informant. Uh, anyway, let's have a little listen now to uh, a report about that. Information just this week from the United States saying that the U.S. tipped off the British authorities about uh, Mohammed Siddiqui Khan anyway, and then there was the original sort of admission, uh, which came quite late, uh, from the security services here that they were aware of him and that they'd been following him tangential to another investigation. I mean, it does all mount up, it seems, over time, that there was more and more information there. No, that's right, and um, I, I don't think, again, that's a, a surprise to people who actually worked in the... Uh, industry, if you like, of intelligence. It's, it was always going to be highly improbable that somebody comes straight out as what the media was calling a clean skin um, and suddenly becomes a, a suicide bomber. Well, the media led on by briefings from the authorities. Uh, I think that's absolutely right, and there was a good reason for that, I'm sure, which was, uh, from their perspective anyway, which was, of course, if these are clean skins, how can we blame the security services for not having uh, been on their trail? As it's turned out, as I think was predictable and predicted, this has turned out to be not the case. The, the, the really, the level of information that was coming in about Khan, uh, uh, particularly if these American reports especially, which uh, now seem to be uh, uh, being backed up by the actual American authorities, not just appearing in an author's book, um, that they tipped off the British about the specifics of Khan, and this was quite a serious plot in the United States that we were talking about, an attempt to blow up, uh, um, an attempt to blow up synagogues and so on. Uh, the amount of information coming in and the quality of information coming in, the fact that that has been so consistently overlooked, it would appear, by the Security Service MI5, to me suggests really only one of two options. Well, either A, we've got a level of incompetence that would be unusual even for the Security Service, but B, possibly, and this is a possibility, that this man Khan may even have been working as an informant for the Security Service. It's difficult otherwise to see how it can be that they've so covered his tracks in the interim. That was uh, intelligence analyst Charles Shoebridge speaking on the BBC World Service. And now we're going to have a listen to John Loftus, who is also an intelligence analyst. Um, and here he is speaking about uh, Ma uh, Abu Hamza and uh, someone who is believed may have been the mastermind. Now, just before we have a listen to that, Adrian, who is, who is this chap, Haroon Aswat, who many people believe may have been the mastermind of the attacks? Well, that is a confusing question because there are disputes as to who Aswat actually is because there are several... People. Well, he was an aide to uh, an assistant to Abu Hamza. Well, that's correct, but, I mean, it, it, his history in terrorism is, is confounded by confusion because there are other Aswats that um, possibly have been linked to his, his name. So now, wasn't he in touch with uh, these alleged bombers in the weeks running up to the attacks? Well, in the weeks running up to, it's been reported, and actually on the morning um, by ITN, The Times and other mainstream um, journalists, um, that he was had phone calls with the men. I mean, what's, what's significant about this is the trial, uh, recent trial last year of um, Salim, Shakil and Ali, um, who also had uh, contact with the alleged bombers. Um, they were on trial specifically because they had contact with these men. And, and why is, is Harun Aswat still in a jail? Uh, he's been sitting there for five years. The press reported that he, he had contact with the men. This is not denied by the Intelligence Security Committee report. Um, and so why was there a trial for those three men and no trial for Aswat, who just sits in a prison and basically... Um, we've been told that he has nothing to do with 7-7 seven, seven, 
even though these connections have not been refuted and appear to be true. Um, so therefore, why is there no um, investigation or trial to do with these connections with the men? OK, well, let's have a listen now to John Loftus talking about this potential real mastermind behind the attacks, Harun Aswat. Yeah, all of these guys seem to be going back to an organisation called al Muhajirun, which means the emigrants. It was the recruiting arm of al-Qaeda in London. They specialised in recruiting kids whose families had emigrated to Britain but who had British passports, and, and they would use them for terrorist work. But the, what they had in common was they were all emigrant groups in Britain recruited by this al Muhajirun group. They were headed by, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, Captain Hook, the uh, <laughs> imam in London, the right. Finsbury Mosque, was at the end. He was the head of that organization. Now, his assistant was a guy named Aswat, Harun Rashid Aswat. Aswat. Aswat is believed to be the mastermind of all the bombings in London. From On the 7 7 and 7 21, this is the guy, we think. This is the guy, and what's really embarrassing is that the entire British police are out chasing him, and one wing of the British government, MI6, or the British Secret Service, right. has been hiding him. And this has been a real source of contention between CIA, Hold on, Justice Department, and Britain. MI6 has been hiding him. Are you saying that he has been working for them? Oh, I'm not saying it. This is what the Muslim Sheik said in an interview in a British newspaper back in 2001. So he's a double agent, or what? He's a double agent. He's yeah, working for the... So he's working for the Brits to try to give them information about al-Qaeda, but in reality, he's still an al-Qaeda operative. Yeah. The CIA and the Israelis all accused MI6 of letting all these terrorists live in London, uh, not because they were getting al-Qaeda information, but for appeasement. It was one of those, you leave us alone, we leave you alone kind of things. Well, we left and him so alone too long then. Absolutely. Now, we knew about this guy, Aswat. Back in 1999, he came to America. The Justice Department wanted to indict him in Seattle because him and his buddy were trying to set up a terrorist training school in Oregon. So they indicted the buddy, right? But why didn't they indict him? Well, it comes out, we've just learned that the headquarters of the U.S. Justice Department ordered the Seattle prosecutors not to touch Aswat. Hello. Now, hold on. <laughs> why? And that's, well, apparently Aswat was working for British intelligence. Now, Aswat's boss, the one-armed Captain Hook, he gets indicted two years later. So the guy above him and below him get indicted, but not Aswat. Now, there's a split of opinion within U.S. intelligence. Some people say that the British intelligence fibbed to us. They told us that Aswat was dead, and that's why the New York group dropped the case. That's not what most of the Justice Department thinks. They think that it was just, again, covering up for this very publicly affiliated guy with al Mujarun. He was a mm -hmm. British intelligence plant. So all of a sudden, he disappears. He's in South Africa. We think he's dead. We don't know he's down there. Last month, the South African Secret Service come across the guy. Yeah, now CIA he's says, alive. oh, he's alive. Our CIA says, uh, okay, let's arrest him. But the Brits say no again? The Brits say no. Now, the, at this point, two weeks ago, the Brits know that the CIA wants to get a hold of Harun. So what happens? He takes off again. Goes right to London. He isn't arrested when he lands. He isn't arrested when he leaves. Even though he's on a watch list. He's on the watch list. The only reason he could get away with that was if he was working for British intelligence. He wow. was a wanted man. And then takes off the day before the bombings, as I understand it? Yeah, and goes to Pakistan. The Pakistan, Pakistan is arrested. They him. jail him. They jail him. He's released within 24 hours back to southern Africa goes through Zimbabwe and is arrested in Zambia. Trying to now get the, US, wow. the U.S., we're trying to get our hands on this guy. Zambia, Pakistan, arrest Haru Naswat. This guy seems to have a get-out-of-jail-free card, even though he's the best mate of uh, Abu Hamza from al Mujarun, the supposedly most dangerous terrorist organisation in the West. Martin. Yes, I mean, what, what we're looking at here, I mean, it's, it's very hard to find out what's actually happening, but what we'd, I would like the listeners to take on board is that you, you haven't heard the full story about what's happened here. We clearly haven't heard the full story. And people do need to understand that, A, the security services may be incompetent and they may be covering up because they're trying to cover up their incompetence in this matter, 
or b the possibility that they are in fact implicated in this matter nobody in pakistan doubts for a moment that the intelligence services the uh, the uh, inter-service intelligence agency in pakistan is implicated in terrorism nobody in belfast presumes that the British intelligence services were not implicated in terrorism. The Omar bomb, for example, Kevin Barrett, who was the uh, British intelligence informer inside the Real, I- Real IRA, gave clear, clear uh, knowledge of where that bomb was going to be planted. The bomb went through and went off. And uh, Nuro Lone, the head of the, uh, the um, uh, Police Investigation Authority in Northern Ireland, said that she's never been happy with the government's explanation of what happened to Omar. Now, of course, if you live in a permanent state of war, as people in Northern Ireland or Pakistan do, you don't take take things at face value. You don't take things for granted. We've only had one major attack in Britain and people are not used to it. They may have to get used to the idea that just as at Bologna or as at Dublin and Monaghan in 1972 or at Bologna in 1980 or has been happening in Turkey for 30 years, it may be our own security services, MI6, which are actually helping these terrorists to carry out their acts because there's a political agenda behind this which is to do with oil, which is to do with money, which is to do with imperial power. Almost all roads in the 77 case seem to lead back to Britain's internal counterintelligence security service, MI5, whose job it is to stop terrorists and foreign spies operating here in Britain. The only problem is MI5 refuses to answer questions, either in the courts or in the press, saying it may damage national security. So what really goes on there at MI5's headquarters, Thames House, at the north side of Lambeth Bridge in London? All their activities are shrouded in a cloak of total secrecy. But all is not lost. Last year, an MI5 officer and whistleblower, Annie Machon, described the inner workings of MI5 when she spoke in Canada about why her and her partner decided they could not, in all conscience, continue to work there. Um, David Shaler and I met in our first section, which was the political subversion section, which we helped to shut down, actually. Um, And we were both in MI5 for about six years. And during that time, in three different postings each, we just saw incrementally things getting worse and worse in terms of um, bombings that could and should have been prevented, in terms of illegal phone taps and operations, and crucially, in terms of two false flag terrorist attacks. The first of which was in London in 1994, when um, the Israeli embassy was car bombed in a very smart part of London. And this was blamed on um, two innocent Palestinians who were arrested, charged and convicted of conspiracy to cause this attack. And they were both sentenced to 20 years each for this attack. And it turned out in the assessment of MI5, the senior officer in charge of the investigation, um, who'd seen all the evidence and all the intelligence, his assessment was that Mossad had bombed their own embassy in a controlled explosion. One to um, gain increased security around Jewish interests in London, but primarily to shatter a Palestinian political network, which was growing very fast in London, and of which these two were members. So that was the first case, and that really made us sit up and think about what we got ourselves into. But the primary case was um, an assassination attempt against Colonel Gaddafi of Libya, and this happened in 1996. And in this case, it was an Islamic extremist terrorist group which was paid by MI6, which is the external intelligence agency. It's a sort of James Bond wing of British intelligence. And they'd paid money to this group to try and assassinate Gaddafi. And they'd done it illegally under UK law because they hadn't gained the permission of their political masters. They can actually get the licence to kill if they get prior written permission for illegal acts abroad. And um, the attack obviously went wrong. Gaddafi is still very much alive. But innocent people died. So this was the thing, this was the case that made David Shaler and I quit. We couldn't think of anything more heinous than the British state, the British intelligence agencies, actually funding a group with Al-Qaeda connections to try and assassinate someone illegally and kill innocent people. So we decided to leave. We hadn't signed up to work for the British intelligence community in order to get involved in organisations that committed terrorism and killed innocent people. So we left. And in 1997, we ended up going public about our concerns about these crimes. And in fact, we ended up going to the newspapers, because under UK law, there's a piece of legislation called the Official Secrets Act, which makes it a crime to report a crime if you are an intelligence officer. So even though we were saying the spies have committed murder, we were the criminals by even saying that, and there was no investigation into MI6's murder attempt against Colonel Gaddafi. 
So we went to the press in order to, one, try and get enough attention to force an inquiry into this assassination attempt, but two, also for protection for ourselves. And we ended up um, blowing the whistle and having to go on the run around Europe. Annie Machon, whistleblower there, an ex-MI5 officer. So who are the MI5 officers responsible for stopping the kinds of attacks like 7-7 happening here in Britain? What kind of people are they? Here's Annie Machon again. Last year in MI5, I was actually trained up to be a recruiter. This was the first year in which they were openly trying to recruit people. They were advertising for them in, in the media and saying, would you like to work for MI5? And they got flooded with applicants, about 20,000 in the first round, of which they chose five. So they had their pick of good graduates. And the sort of things they were looking for were obviously intelligence, um, you know, mental intelligence, good analytical skills, good communication skills, and the ability to influence other people. So if you went out into the field and had to deal with agents, they would trust you. But also things like tenacity and um, an ethical framework within which you worked. So basically they wanted everything. They wanted so, a very rounded human being who could do a wide variety of work. And because they were MI5 and because they sounded glamorous and because they never told the recruits exactly what they'd be getting up to when they joined, they got those sort of people. What they then found, of course, was they couldn't retain them. One of the most common misconceptions is that people model up intelligence officers and intelligence agents. Annie explains the difference and, crucially, what tricks they use to get agents and others to do what they want them to do. They have intelligence officers who are full-time employees who organise the operations, run the operations and assess the information that comes out of them. And that's what I was. You, so you work for MI5. The people you're talking about are then defined as agents. So they don't work. They're sort of like contractors. And they are employed by MI5 um, to infiltrate organisations or to go and bug people's houses or whatever. So they're the sort of cutouts. Um, they are the ones who do have to befriend people in groups, are the ones who betray those friendships and report back. And it's an interesting psychological study of why people will do that. MI5 always had this thing which they had a little acronym for, which was MICE, which was money, idealism, compromise and ego. So uh, you could buy someone to do it, they would do it for ideological belief, you caught them out in an embarrassing situation and blackmailed them, or you, fl you flattered them. You basically said, come on, do something really good. We know you can do it and nobody else can. Mm -hmm. So that was how they got the agents to infiltrate these groups. However, in the UK, what we've seen worryingly in the last few years is a sort of explosion in private security firms as well. In the US, notoriously, we have Blackwater, which has gone into Iraq and murdered people with legal impunity. Um, but in the UK, we have other companies like Kroll or Diligence, which in fact was set up by one of my ex-colleagues and is doing very well. And they get paid... Uh, by big corporations primarily to go, on spy, go and spy on activist groups. So, you know, an arms company is worried about some protesters, they, they buy the services of these companies or environmental camps and things like that. So there's a sort of the official spies who have very little oversight anyway from the government. Then you have the unofficial spies, many of whom are former ex-spooks anyway. Um, doing all this stuff what, completely what, would, outside what the law. would be the, to your knowledge, the, the split now between the official spies who are paid by the government and these contract spies? Um, MI5 in my day had about 2,000 full-time staff, and out of that, there would probably be about four or 500 intelligence officers, and the rest were support staff. Um, now they have virtually doubled that number, but that's still quite a small organisation. And then, of course, you have the agents around that organisation who are infiltrating the groups. Um, in terms of the commercial companies, they are massive. I mean, we're talking many, many large companies. And there have been a series of scandals over the last few years revealed in the UK press of people who have been caught out spying on these activist groups. So, you know, who can tell what's happening with meetings like this as well? Certainly in the UK, there may well be infiltration from MI5 agents. I would say there almost certainly would be infiltration from the police because there's a sort of second tier of intelligence work in the UK where we have the secret police doing this sort of thing. And possibly as well, of course, these commercial spies. And they could actually all be running around treading each other's toes as well. because They normally often... don't know each other, Exactly, do they? exactly. Yeah. So they can cause each other problems as well. That was Annie Machon, uh, ex-MI5 officer and whistleblower, speaking in Canada to Barry Zwicker uh, last year. I thought that was quite interesting, Martin, uh, that the, the, there are four different ways that the, uh, these intelligence people use to sort of persuade people to do what they want them to do. Money, idealism, blackmail and ego. Um, and what, are your, what are your thoughts about what we've heard there, particularly to do with this privatisation of the intelligence Annie's talking about? 
with well, you know with people who've been trained up by the state, then going and setting up their own little private intelligence company. Well, the the problem is that none of us really know what goes on in this world. We've just been given a little peek into it by Annie there, explaining some of what she knows. But of course, the whole purpose of intelligence operations is that most people don't know what's going on, and of course, you don't necessarily know if you're an intelligence agent what else is going on in your organisation. I mean, she and David Shaler uh, resigned from MI5 because they came across operations which they thought were unethical. I'd just like to pick up on the on the, that, that earlier things that she was saying. The Islamic Fighting Group which was being paid by MI6 to assassinate Colonel Gaddafi, was the Libyan branch of al-Qaeda. So we've got a clear linkage between the British intelligence services cooperating with al-Qaeda. This is long before the bombings of September the 11th or 7-7. Most of these Islamic jihadi groups were set up in the 80s under Operation Cyclone to fight inside Afghanistan. Head of Operation Cyclone in the CIA at the time was Robert Gates. He is still the US Defence Secretary. This is the sort of thing that people really need to take on board. The Islamic, these Islamic groups are actually a creature of the Western intelligence services. At what point did they go rogue, if they ever did go rogue? Now, Adrian, uh, before we finish, I wonder if you could just tell us about uh, you, what your website is. Um, and I also would just like to add that there is actually quite a lot of films around. I mean, Costa Gavras is the head of the British, the, the French uh, National Film Institute. He made a lot of films about this, about uh, this kind of thing going on in South America uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. But what websites uh, would you recommend, and your own one, obviously, Adrian, for people, if people want to follow yeah. this up? Well, first of all, I'd like to encourage people to investigate some, some of themselves and um, july7.co.uk is a website of some people I know that's very good um, my website is officialconfusion.com where you can find information about the bombs at Russell Square Aldgate, Edgware Road and of course a bus at Tavistock Square and much much more thank you OK, thanks very much. Well, that's all for this week. Coming up next, the Sky News at 7 o'clock. After that, Friday night is music night. Stand by for our mashup and up and up and up to the weekend. You'll be in the capable hands of the lovely Sam, a.k.a. DJ Spungold. Do please join us at 5 on Friday Drive Time each week here on BCFM. If you have a story for us, questions about this evening's programme, or would like to suggest a guest for a future show, please go to our webpage thisweek.org.uk or email me at tony at bcfm. .org.uk. Thanks very much to this week's guest in the first hour, Conservative MP for Bristol North West, Charlotte Leslie. Thanks too to Marina Morris, Old Labour Oxford economist Martin Summers, and of course, local researcher and investigative filmmaker Adrian Connock. Next, next week, more conspiracy facts will be quitting.